Thank you, Brother Borders. Let us remain standing just a moment while we bow silently before God for prayer. Is there any request tonight you'd like to make known by lifting up your hand to God and asking Him for mercy? Let us bow our heads now. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are coming again into Thy presence for mercy, knowing that Thou hast promised us that we should obtain mercy if we would show mercy. The merciful shall obtain mercy. And if we have sinned and did that which was wrong in Thy sight, God, be merciful to us. Because that we love Thee and we believe Thee, Lord, with all that's in us. And we stand tonight between the living and the dead and ask that You'll be kind to us and wash away all of our unbelief. That tonight the great Holy Spirit might do the work of God among us and would bring reality to the people of the resurrection of God's beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. Now, we thank Thee in the past that how He has never failed us. We can all witness that who are Christians, that He's with us always. And we pray tonight that sinners might know Him as their Savior, that those who are now become Christians on believing on Him, that they would seek the deeper experiences to have eternal life granted unto them through the baptism of the Spirit, that they might be harnessed soldiers for the great battle that lies ahead. We pray for the sick and the afflicted, that there will not be a feeble person among us when the service closes tonight. Grant it, Lord. Hear us, we pray. You've seen every hand that went up. You know every request beneath that hand in the heart. We pray, Father, that you'll grant each and every one of them their request. And when we leave tonight, may we be able to say like those coming back from Emmaus after they had acknowledged and seen the resurrected Jesus, may we say, did not our hearts burn within us as he spake to us along the way? For we asked it in his name and for his glory. Amen. You may be seated. We are so happy to be here again tonight. And I see the people are bringing in their handkerchiefs. We, we advocate that. We believe that God does answer prayer for those who are, are sick and needy. And that he will grant the request of people who believe in him and will ask for mercy. Now, we've been having a great time in uh, worshiping with you Christians here in Oregon. Now, I've been trying to keep the message just as simple as possible. But, of course, that's so that no one will miss it. It's great, deep spiritual teachings to it, but sometimes you can't do that before an audience. We must keep it simple so that the newborn babes will not miss it because I believe that we're too close to the end time for us to miss anything. We must be real sure that we're, we're right and doing that which is right, what God has commanded us to do. And now we got... Two more after tonight, gracious meetings, tonight being third. That closes Sunday afternoon. And we're expecting, I am, uh, this is my last American meeting for a while till I'll take some rest. This is my ninth straight meeting. I'm getting pretty tired. I got two yet in Canada before I have some rest. And then I'm going overseas, the Lord willing, over into the countries beyond so that uh, they, too, or take a trip around, perhaps, this time. I got a note this morning from a friend of mine that was here in the meeting last night. If he's here tonight, God bless you, Sam. I'm very glad that you're doing well here in Oregon. I baptized this fella 
Many years ago, he runs a nursery here somewhere, according to his card, Sammy Sanders, uh, from Milltown, Indiana. I baptized him. I was pastor in the Milltown Baptist Church at Milltown, Indiana. Are you here, Sam? Raise up your hand if you are. I like to. Yes, I hear him somewhere. <laughs> yes. What, yes. Oh, oh, back over in here. All right. The Lord bless you, Sam. Up in the corner. I remember the day, that cold day, taking Sam down to the river to baptize him. His people thought he went off on the deep end, but he hadn't. Let's keep holding on, Sammy boy. I hope I can get out to see you before the service in here. You know, it's such strain. Uh, you have to stay under prayer, expecting to see what the Holy Spirit would tell you to do at any moment. See, you don't know just what to do. Many times he calls me, go down, stand on the street corner, a certain person will come by, tell him this, and watch what happens. And um, you have to be ready. And that's the reason I've been trying to keep the message just as simple as possible. What I'm trying to do, maybe some of you might be wondering why I'm not calling prayer lines each night. Here's my purpose. In doing this, I want to build faith in the people in a resurrected Jesus so that you don't have to wait till some a special gift passes through the neighborhood. You just believe him wherever you are because he's God. It don't take an evangelist's hands, which that's all right. They place their faith. But when the services is over and each night you're, I see things happening, I can't call it fast enough. Of course not. It's happening too fast. But you'll know after I'm gone, the things, disease that you've had is gone. You might not recognize it now, but it's gone. Here some time ago, I was in a meeting, a couple of states from here, and there was two ladies that attended the meeting. Each one of them, one of them was on the platform, the other in a meeting out in the audience. And the Holy Spirit told a lady who had a serious stomach trouble, she couldn't eat at all. She hadn't been able to eat for many years, told her, said, go home. You are well. Jesus Christ makes you well. Now watch what he says. Don't rush off. Wait a minute. See what he says. That's your own faith pulling that. But then that's what you yourself are doing. Then wait and see what he tells you. See, that, that's when, then that's, you hear that comes out, thus saith the Lord. Then you write that down. That's, it's going to happen that way. So it had happened, I guess Brother Borders has explained to you. I'll leave that up to the manager to tell you how these things are recovered, how to get your prayer card, how we come and mix those cards up and pass them out to anybody that wants them like that. And it's called from different places. That's to keep people from saying, well, uh, they don't get number one or number two or somewhere along there. They throw their card down. They don't want it. No one knows where the prayer lines go to start. God chooses that himself. And the boy that gives out prayer cards stands before you first and mixes them cards all together and hands them out to you as, as you want them. So you might get number one. You say, I'm going to be the first one in the line. You may be the last one. And then one to get next to you might get number 90. And he might be the first one. See, you can't tell. And that gives everybody a chance. And Brother Borders explains that. Then how? That after that prayer has been made over this demon disease that you've got and all sicknesses of the devil. And then when that prayer has been made, it's impossible for it not to happen as long as you believe that it does happen. Now you go to doubt and when the unclean spirit's gone out of a man, he walks in dry places. Then he returns back with seven other devils worse than he was at the beginning. Now people watch that. They say, oh, well, uh, I got worse. Now wait a minute. If you haven't doubted, still hold on. Because if it's like a tumor or something, it's a group of cells, and them cells has got to die, the life in those cells. Then the cells rot, and the heartbeat has to pack that infection through the bloodstream. Yeah. See? And you get ten times worse than you were. But faith holds right there, Amen. no matter what takes place. You've got to be instructed on these things. If God willing, I'm giving a try now of evangelism. We know the revival's over. Everyone knows that. I predicted that back in 56 when it would start ending. Billy Graham come back and Tommy Osborne and them. I said, this is it. America will receive it or reject it this year. And they rejected it. We're nothing waiting but judgment. Now, you mark that down and see if Brother Branham's right or not. That's thus saith the Lord. We're headed for it. We're going to pay for what we've done. We've got too much glamour in the church and Hollywood and everything. God's sick and tired of it. 
The last one will come in after a while, and that'll be it. I would like to have a time, if God permits, before the end time when I could set up a tent in a certain vicinity and just come like and stay there for about four or five weeks. And just stay there where you could have a morning session just with minister brothers. And so if they could teach their congregation afterwards, then stay in there and someone be prayed for and then get worse and don't know what it is, bring that person back into an instruction room and let them know, examine them over and see what's happened. See, that's when you, I believe we get a better result, something like that. But now you've just got to catch it in a night or two and keep it real simple so that everybody will get a hold of it. It's baby to the clergyman and so forth. But it isn't baby form. But we want to get this before the people. This is my purpose, is to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is not dead, but he is alive. The prophets came, they killed him one by one. The prophets and monarchs and so forth, they was killed. When the son came, they said, he's heir, so we'll kill him. But when they killed him, he raised up again. So he's alive forevermore. Amen. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if I could only get the people to realize that, you'll see something spontaneously happen here that'll, that'll shake the whole country. Now, remember, when we talk shake the country, that don't mean shake the cannon fodder out here. There's millions up and down this coast here that profess Christianity will never see nothing. That's right. When, when John came, there wasn't one hundredth of the people ever know to his own earth. When Jesus came, I doubt there's that many that, of the people living on earth that ever know he was there. He was just sent to those who he was called. All the Father has given me will come and no man can come except my Father has called him. Amen. So it's just for that elected group. That's been called. The message will go forth, but it'll just go right on over, just like he said. Some fell by the wayside and some this way, but some went over. And a lot of it's just filler to fill in the time. Millions of people that's professing Christianity will miss it a million miles. That's right. It's all in the making of God. We don't want to go into those details. It's here in the Bible. And it's the Word of the Lord, Exactly. So the thing for you to do and I to do is seek out our own salvation, not just haphazardly. It means more than everything there is on the earth and anything to you. This is your chance, and don't you take any chance of missing it. Heaven is great. Not long ago, many of you read in the magazines about the little translation the Lord gave me. Not translation. I won't say it that way. It stumbles people. The vision, I would say, I've seen that place. I was there. I ought to know what visions is. I've seen them since I was a little boy. And I asked anybody ever tell me where one was wrong. It can't be wrong and be God. God can't be wrong. See, it isn't me. I'm wrong all the time, but he's never wrong. So when he speaks, it's true. I seen not long ago, I was standing in a lobby waiting for an airplane. And I seen where they had sent down into the, a mile deep in the sea. And it took down there were those fish with no eyes. And they, and they had a light there. They were showing the most hideous looking, uh, marine life. And those, some of them had phosphorus on the front of them. And I was thinking, one came by, looked like a, something with a stovepipe hat on. I never seen such a hideous looking thing. Now, if that thing had no eyes, but yet it has another sense that it's direction to find its food. Now, I was thinking when I was looking at that, what if I could use my eyes and let that little fish surrender itself to me with my sense of sight, how I could guide it. I could see its food way over here and say, don't pay attention to your own radar or whatever you're going by because you have to be close to it. I can tell you where your food's at. And it would just listen to me, to my sense of sight is so much greater than his sense of how he has to direct himself, how much better off he would be. How he could feed, what difference, he'd be an odd little fish, but he'd be following a sense of sight that was far better than the sense he was controlled by. That's the way it is by the Holy Ghost. If we can just let the Holy Ghost, that great sense of the Holy Spirit, direct us and show us things that is to come, way beyond the things, see? Now, what if that little fish would, he never seen daylight? What if he would try to come up through the water? He couldn't do it. He's pressurized for that depths of the sea. If he'd come up, he would explode. We are pressurized for the earth. 
We cannot go a little piece up and we would explode. That's right. But now, what if that little fish could ever become me? Would I ever want to go back in that midnight ink down there and ever be a, that kind of an animal again with them kind of a sights or senses? No, sir. I want to be a human. Now, multiply that by a hundred million, and then God has to change this mortal being that we are. We're repressurized and taken up into His presence, where some we never want to have this kind of a thing again. It's far beyond. We're changed from the creature. Listen, my dear friends, you people here, I'm not here because of no place to go. I'm here because I felt led to come here. Here sits the manager with a book full of places whirled around, see? But I felt led to come here. I come here through difficult. The brethren here, as we was in the meeting the other morning, I hope you caught what was going on in the breakfast. And there, seeing under difficult, they brought me here. Knowing that even before I left home, by vision, seeing it. And we're here because that God's got something here this morning. About eight o'clock this morning, I was caught away in a vision and seen. I was worried about the meeting and I seen a woman come before me and sit down. And she said, it's wonderful above anything that we can think. And I thought, what is this? And I heard him speak to me. He said, just keep pressing on. Don't fear. Keep moving on. So I know, I know beyond any shadow of doubt. That's thus saith the Lord. There's something fixing to happen or going on here. You're either going to see a great spontaneous revival or you're going to see a judgment or there's somebody that he's seeking for. Or there's something I don't know, but he's pleased with doing what we're doing right now. Keep pulling everyone you can and try our best. That's all we know. And if you believe me to be his servant, remember that's in the name of the Lord. Now, simple, trying to make it simple. Keep it that way. You're not long ago, a very fine religious man with a great standing in this nation. And he called me into his room and he said, Reverend Branham, I want to say something to you. And I said, yes, sir, say on. And he said, I admire you as a servant of Christ and that I believe you are. I said, thank you, sir. I can pay the compliments to you. We were two different ideas, but yet we recognize one another as servants of Christ. He said, I brought you in here to pray for you. Thank you, sir. I said, I certainly need it. And he said, I want to ask you something. He said, why don't you quit picking on them people? I said, what do you mean, sir? He said, you're going on to them women about bobbing off their hair, wearing immoral clothes, and their husbands, how little they are to let their wives do such things, and carrying on like that. He said, the people regard you as a prophet. I said, did you ever hear me say I was? He said, no, but the people regard you as that. Said, you see, you ought to be p- teaching those people how to receive great spiritual gifts and be lifted up and have heavenly things like that and great manifestations of the Spirit. You ought to be teaching that instead of about their bobbed hair and wearing clothes the way they do. I said, sir, if they can't understand their ABCs, how am I going to teach them algebra? Yes. That's right. Amen. Not the common decency to act upon the Word of God. You know what ABC stands for? Always believe Christ and He is the Word. That's right. Yeah. What makes people do that? Just a minute. What makes people do that? It's because that you are giving vent to the very thing that God placed in you. You're thirsting for something and you're trying to satisfy it with the pleasures of this world. God made a man to thirst when he made his heart. He made him to thirst because he made him to thirst after him. And dare anybody to try to to, uh, satisfy that holy uh, thirst with the things of the world. That was putting you to thirst after him. As a heart painteth for the water brook, my soul thirst after thee, O God. Not that I'm angry with the church. I'm in love with the church. And I know that the, something's fixing to happen. And that's why I say, get ready, people. You can't do those things. Your outward expression shows their inward work of grace hasn't been done yet. No matter how much you shouted, how much you spoke in tongues, danced in the Spirit, whatever you might have called your emotions, lest that life copes with this word, and you hear that word and turn away from it, there's something wrong. 
the Holy Spirit in you will always punctuate the word with amen. It's the truth. See? That's right. So that's what I'm trying to do. Trying to cast everything I can. It's in love. When Ella Ezer was sent from Abraham to find a bride for his son Isaac, a type of the father and the son and the servant and so forth, Ella Ezer sweated it out until he found character. And when he found character, he had it. And that's what the Holy Spirit's trying to find today is character. You can't have character until you got faith. And faith produces character. And when he found the beautiful Rebecca, notice when she come to Isaac, she veiled her face. Why? She had no more head. The man was the head. When a woman gets married, she puts a veil over her face. Why? She's coming to her head. And the church, when the Holy Spirit finds the church, she veils herself. Christ is her head and Christ is the Word. Amen. Yeah. She cares no more about her traditions and things. Christ is her head. Hallelujah. Character. Many years ago, they used to have the slaves down in the south. And those slaves were sad. And they sold them like you would a used car out here on the lot. Auction them off. Get a bill of sales with them. Human beings. That's not right. Never was right. I'm a southerner, but it wasn't right. God made man and man made slaves. No race is to rule over the other. We are brothers off of the same tree, Adam. And we are brothers. We can give one another a transfusion, red man, black man, brown man, whatever it might be. We're human beings. And we should not make slaves of one another. But they come along auction off and they take the big heavy slave away from his little spindly wife set him over here and breed him to another woman that was bigger to bring forth bigger slaves that was ungodly never was right some time ago I was in a certain museum I was noticing going to the museum there was an old colored man and he had just a white rim of hair around his head it's been about 25 years ago I guess maybe 30 I was looking this fellow, and he was looking all around. I wonder, what's the old darky looking for? He's watching everywhere as he went along. And after a while, he'd come to a certain place, and he stopped all at once. He stepped back, bowed his head, and began praying. I watched him for a few minutes. I walked over close to him. I said, tears were streaming down his black cheeks. I said, pardon me, uncle as we call the mostly the colored brethren, uncle. I said, pardon me, uncle, but I see you were praying. I said, I'm a minister. I'm a Baptist minister. And I would like to ask you why you were so excited. What excited you? He looked at me, wiped his eyes out, tucked me by the arm, said, look, laying there. I looked over under a glass, and there was nothing but just a... Ladies' dress, an old-fashioned dress. And I said, what's so strange about that would excite you? He said, sir, you see that stain on there? And I said, yes, sir. He said, that's the stain of the blood of Abraham Lincoln. He said, on my side is a mark of a slave belt. That blood freed me from that slave belt. Hallelujah. Wouldn't that excite you? I thought, if that would excite the blood of Abraham Lincoln would excite a slave because he was taken off of a slave belt. What ought the blood of Jesus Christ to do to the church? It ought to throw us to our knees in tears. We were Satan's slaves. He tucked the belt off of us. One day on an old plantation, a buyer came by. There's many slaves. And they'd have to whip them because they were sad they were brought from Africa by the Boers and sold to the southern people for slaves. And then when they noticed that always that they were sad, they'd never be back home. They'd never be with Papa, Mama, with no more with the wife, with the children. They were, they were sad. And they'd have to whip them to make them work. But this Slave buyer, one day, he noticed on there, there was one young man they didn't have to whip. 
chest sticking out, chin up, right on the dot at any time. And the buyer said, I would like to buy that slave. But the owner said, he's not for sale. He said, uh, uh, what makes him so much different from the other slaves? said, is he the boss over the rest of them? He said, no, he's a slave. I bought him and he's just a slave. He said, uh, well, maybe you feed him different from the rest of them. He said, no, no. He, uh, he's all he out there in a the galley, just like the rest of the slaves. He said, then what makes him so much different from the rest of them? And the owner said, I wondered that for a long time. But one day I found out. Over in the homeland, he's an alien here, but over in the homeland where he came from, his father is a king of the tribe. And though he be an alien and in another land, he conducts himself as a king's son. God have mercy upon us. If we are the sons and daughters of God, yet we're an alien in this life, God's looking for character for men and women who can conduct themselves as sons and daughters of the king. God have mercy on us that we will do it. That's what I'm after, friends. Character. That's what God's pulling for. Character for that bride that'll be taken out. And as sons and daughters of God, let's act like it. Be sons and daughters. God help us. I want to say something. I want to announce my subject tonight. That's why I'm keeping it simple. I'll be real reverent and listen just for a few moments. And remember my purpose is to, by prayer and faith, bring Jesus Christ, the God that you love and serve, right into your midst. Why can't you accept him and believe him when he's right here with you? With the Bible promises behind. That's the reason I made it the way it is, just Real simple, so that you won't miss it. See, now when he's right here with you, moving right along through you, proving himself right there with you as the Scripture said he was, and what he would be. What he was, he still is, and will forever be. And watch him moving around among you, and then that, to me, that ought to thrill you in such a way you, you just plow through every unbelief. Yes. Amen. Lay aside everything that was ungodly. Hallelujah. Stand up and make your confession. Grass Valley, not long ago, a few weeks ago, I spoke on the immorals of the church today, and every bobbed-haired woman in the state stood up, and ministers stood up and cried out for mercy. Then God, the very next night, emptied every seat, every wheelchair, every cop, everything else, and made everybody perfectly whole. Brother, God's got conditions you've got to meet. You must meet those. And if you can't do the little earthly things, how we go to ever get up here and have heavenly things taught to us? Amen. So let's keep it earthly until that part's over. Then we'll get up in the heavenlies. I'm going to announce my subject before I read the Scripture. My subject tonight is a testimony on the sea. And my text tonight is, Be not afraid... It is I. I remember my subject is a testimony upon the sea. And my text is, Be not afraid, it is I. Now, to you that wants to read the Scripture, let's turn in the Bible now. The Word of God, each one has his Bible. I want you to turn and read with me. Matthew 14, chapter, and begin with the 22nd verse. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into his ship and to go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves. And the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. 
But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of a good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. It must have been getting late. It had a great meeting that day. The sun was going down, setting across the little Galilee lake. And they was all tired. They were worn out. A great day meeting peoples and making this a drama so children can catch it. And everybody was weary and tired. I can see the great brawny back of that big fisherman as he tugged at the boat, pushing it out across the sand until he got it in the water so it would float or the, in the water, climbed up into the uh, stern of the boat and tuck his seat by the side of his brother Andrew. And all on the bank there must have been thousands of people, all, some of them, wiping their eyes from tears and saying, Come back, see us again, bring him back again. You know, there's something about having a meeting. That when you have a good spiritual meeting where something's gone on, great things has took place, you just hate to leave the people. And the people hates to see you leave them. That's always been a great heartache to me after a great meeting to say, Bye-bye. I know there's many there I'll never see again in this life. And what I've said is recorded on the books. And I'll have to meet them with that in the day of the judgment. So I'll be careful what I say. Keep it with the word. Now, as they picked up their oars and began to move away, they'd probably... Now, them days, the boats wasn't, um, wasn't powered by motors as we have today. Sometimes it was a sail. They used both sail and oar. And it wasn't a ship like we have, as the Bible puts it here, in the ship. But they were large boats, uh, more like a, a fish boat. And they had uh, oars, great huge oars. And the man that handled these oars had to know what he was doing. Because the waves, anyone knows that if you get in a storm on the lakes or the sea, you can't just let that boat drive itself and chop, it'll sink. You've got to know how to catch these waves and ride them up sideways and down. If you take your boat right up and it comes over the white cap, you better watch, it'll sink it, it'll go right fill up full of water. So you have to know how to ride those waves with the boat. So therefore, they usually put uh, maybe a man on each side in the small boat. Sometimes they had two on an oar. But usually one man on an oar in a small fish boat like this was. And they kept time. And then when they got into a storm, they had to know just exactly how to pull these oars to make this boat ride the waves that they could ride it out. Then they had a sail. When the winds is blowing, the waves not too great. They could take this sail and tack sometimes, and you know how it is in sailing. But this was real smooth. It was a beautiful day, and the and the old sea was just as quiet, not a riffle in it. And what a pleasure it must have been to dip those oars down at that fresh water and bend those backs to that, and just in time each oar. It's like a rhythm. And then they'd make two or three oars and somebody would stop and all of them wave goodbye and on and on until the little group on the bank began to get smaller and smaller. And to them, the little boat got smaller as they went out. Finally, they were past seeing each other out into the sea. The sun was getting well down now, just red streaks up in the sky from the sun from the distant Galilean mountains. And then we noticed as they went along, it must have been young John. He was the youngest of the bunch. He got tired. He wasn't as able to oar as those big old fishermen who had lived on the sea all their life and strong arms and no, used to that oaring day and night. And young John, and he probably in his 30s or 20s or 30s, must have stopped and wiped the perspiration, throwed the hair back out of his face and said, Brethren, let's, let's rest a few minutes. Ah, uh, this kind of wearing me down. I'm tired. And they pulled the oars and must sit quiet for a few minutes. Nobody's saying nothing. 
And after a while, young John must have turned around and said, I would like to testify while we're resting here. You know how it is? After you've had a meeting, something has happened, thrilled you, you must testify about it. You've got to tell somebody about it. Amen. So young John said, I'd like to give a testimony. That is one thing that after today, we can say truly that we're not following a false prophet. It certainly was convincing to anyone today to see that we are not following a, fa following a false prophet as many teachers of our days are telling us that we are. We're following a man that don't belong to any great organization. He condemns them and so forth. And they tell us that we're just off on the deep end, but we are not. For I can clearly remember when I was a little boy, I would go to listen to a testimony meeting. Let's join in with them now thinking of herself. John says, when I was a little boy, I can remember when my mama would get me on the porch. We were raised down uh, near Jericho. And in the springtime, when I'd pick my mother a bunch of flowers and, and I'd see her pretty uh, brown eyes, as I would bring them to her and she would put me in her arms and rock me and sing me songs about God. And she used to tell me Bible stories. And how I love to hear those Bible stories. And she told me about just down below the ford there, the great mighty Joshua stood there one day and commanded that water to move back in the month of April when the waters was flowing down and the Jordan held her peace while our people walked into the land that they were promised. How that he met the great warrior when he pulled his sword standing against the gate. And he, Joshua, the great warrior, pulled his sword to meet the man. And he said, Who are you? Are you for us? Are you our enemies? And he said, I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua threw off his helmet and fell down on his knees. And I remember Mama telling us, telling me rather, as she rocked me, she said, Listen, John, my little boy, Always believe God. One day when our people were slaves down in Egypt, great Jehovah God sent his prophet down there. Following, we did a pillar of fire, our people. And they come out in the wilderness without anything. Just what clothes they had on. And God brought bread down every night and laid it out on the ground. And our people eat bread in that wilderness for 40 years. And I used to be enthused as a little boy. I said, Mama, does God have a whole big row of ovens up there in heaven and a bunch of angels working night work that they get up there and bake all this bread and run down and lay it on the ground? She'd say, No, son. You understand as a child. God doesn't have to have bake ovens. God is a creator. And all that God had to do was just speak the word. And the bread fell on the earth. Hallelujah. And now, my brethren, he said, Today, when I seen him bring that little boy up there with those five little biscuits and two fishes. And I seen him break that bread and multiply that to feed 5,000 people. I know that was no false prophet. Yeah. He had to be associated with Jehovah God because here again... The very God that we believe in was right here doing His same works again. He was creating bread. Yes. It must be the same God that led our people into this land. Amen. Sure. Amen. I want to ask you, that little boy probably playing truant from school with that little biscuit or two in his hands. See, that little biscuit didn't mean nothing. It could only take care of him as long as he had it. As long as in his hands it wasn't very much. But once placed into the hands of Jesus, it fed 5,000. And that little faith that you got in God, as long as you hold it to yourself, it won't mean very much. But once give it to Him, yeah. see what takes place. Glory to God. If there would happen to be a scientist along, I'd like to ask you, what kind of an atom did he let loose there? Yeah. Yeah. Not only was it fish, but it was cooked fish. 
not only wheat bread, but it was cooked bread. Yeah. I can hear John say, I stood and looked at him. Did you notice him? How calmly and quiet. He wasn't scared. He said, how, many, how much bread have you got? He said, we got five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them to me and cause the companies to sit down by fifties. Oh, my. Not excited. He noted exactly what he was going to do. And he said, brethren, didn't he look like Jehovah? Did you notice his eyes? How strong, how he looked. He looked just like Jehovah. And he was Jehovah. Standing there, breaking this bread, multiplying these fishes and things, and feeding 5,000 people. Therefore, brethren, we are not following a false prophet, because if Jehovah ever was Jehovah, he has to still be Jehovah. And if this man is what he claims to be, the son of Jehovah, he'll do the works of Jehovah. Amen. Amen. How sensible that testimony was. Must have really thrilled him. And it must have been Simon. You know, he always had to put in his part anyhow. He said, wonderful, John. I appreciate that testimony. Let me put mine in right now. Andrew, now you just keep still a minute. His brother's sitting next to him. Andrew went to stay all night with him. The next morning here, he come back telling me we found a Messiah. Now, I'm a Bible reader. I know what Messiah's supposed to be. And I know there's been lots of them come around saying Messiah, but, and this was the Christ and the time was at hand and so forth. This is predicted to be in the last days. Again, many will come, false prophets, and time's at hand. And I, the Messiah's out in the wilderness. The Messiah's here. So don't you believe it. If you listen to that. Now, notice. But he said, my father told Andrew and I one time that when the Messiah cometh, he'd have to come according to the Scripture, the scriptural Messiah. And when I walked up into his presence that day with my brother Andrew sitting here, and he looked at me in the face and said, your name is Simon. You are the son of Jonas. I know that that was Messiah. I know that we hadn't had a prophet for 400 years and my father showed me in the scripture according to this scroll of Deuteronomy that Moses wrote that Moses, our prophet, that we've lived all these hundreds of years faithful to his teachings, that he said, the Lord your God shall raise up among you a prophet like unto me. And it'll come to pass that whosoever shall not hear this prophet will be cut off from the people. Now, I know that my father taught me by the Scriptures that that Messiah would be a prophet. And when I saw him do the sign of the prophet, I know that was the Messiah. Amen. Oh, how that must have done something to them. Yes. And Philip said, I'd like to testify. Is it all right, Nathaniel? He said, well, go ahead. Give your testimony. And Nathaniel said, may I say a word first? And everybody, you know, and... And uh, Nathaniel jumped up and, and he said, sit down, you're rocking the boat. You know how I'd get in a testimony meeting. Everybody's just got to say something, you know, right quick. And uh, said, you, you can get your turn, but sit down, wait a minute. Stand still. You're rocking the boat. And said, now sit down and tell us your testimony. And he said, when Philip came to me, I was back there under the tree a praying. And when I was praying for God to send the deliverer, And when Philip walked up to me and said, we have found the Messiah, we've got him, we know who it is, it's the son of Joseph, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, I doubted him. I said, now, wait a minute, nothing good could come from Nazareth, from that group of people. But he encouraged me. He said, you come see for yourself. Now, that's a good answer. Don't stay home and criticize it. Come take your Bible and search it and see if it's right. For it's your soul, you know. So then he said, we come up to the meeting, and as soon as we got to where Jesus of Nazareth was, he looked me straight in the face and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. And I said, Rabbi, when did you ever know me? He said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. And it was very convincing to me. That settled it. Brethren, you all know what I did. I fell right down at his feet and said, Thou art the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Because I know scripturally that was the Messiah that we were looking for. 
I note it by the sign that he told us. Must have been Andrew who said, just a moment. Let all of us think of something for a few minutes. Do you remember the day that we were going down to Jericho? Yes, I remember it. And you remember some strange thing. He had need to go by Samaria? Yes, we remember that. And he got up there to this city, Sychar, and when he did, he sent us into the city to buy vittles. And you know how they treat us in the city? And when we come back up to where he was, we were astonished. Our master was being entertained by an ill-famed woman. Now, in them days, they had a mark. You could tell them. Nowadays, they're not. But they could tell they were ill-famed the way she was doing. And we were astonished, you know, brethren, that our master would be caught with such a person. An ill-famed person like this woman was. Uh, why, she was nothing but a, a, just a common street woman. And here our master was out there by himself by the side of this well entertaining this woman. So we were all astonished. All of us said, that's right, that's right. So they, you said, we moved around behind the bushes to find out what he was talking about. And we heard him when he said, woman, bring me a drink. And we thought, now, isn't that strange that our master would ask the service of a prostitute? That shows what he was to me. He was God. Sure. He asked over who, whoever, ever mortal, no matter what condition you're in, whosoever will. Isn't it strange we thought that our master would ask this ill-famed woman to do him a favor? And we were surprised. And we found out that quickly she spoke back to him and she said, Sir, it's not customary you being a Jew asking me a, a woman of Samaria. And Mark started to say something. Andrew said, keep still just a minute. So then he said, listen. He said, you remember what he said? He said, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. And I'd give you waters. You don't come here to draw. And they carried the conversation for a while about the religion. And then for the first time, we thought our master was caught in a trap. For our master said to the woman, Go get your husband and come here. And quickly she turned and looked him in the face and said, I don't have a husband. You remember how our hearts like to fail us? We thought, now, now there's something wrong. Here our master says to that woman, go get your husband. And we had seen the Messiah sign over him and everything, and we knowed he was the Messiah. And here... See his works and know he was that prophet that God said he would raise up. We know he was. But yet here's a woman denying that he is telling the truth. Just like Sarah denied before the angel. I never said it. But you see what the angel said. So they stood there just a moment. And he said, I have no husband. Then our master looked her straight in the face and said, You have told the truth. Now we couldn't understand that. The Lord. Why it was here one minute, he says, You have a husband. And she denied that she had a husband. And then he turns back and said, You told the truth. Then you remember how all flustrated we were? And then he said to her, You have told the truth because you've had five husbands. Yeah. And the one that you're now living with is not your husband. Yeah. So you have told the truth. How we were all alarmed. See what the woman would say. We know when he did this, the Pharisees, the church, the unbelievers, they said, this man is a fortune teller, Beelzebub, a devil. But this little woman, in her condition, turned and looked him in the face and said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. We know when Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things, but who are you? And he said, I'm he that speaks with you. And on that she ran into the city and began to tell the man of the city that come see a man who's told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? Now that would go right over the top of an unbeliever. They'd never know it. They were predestinated to disbelieve the word. Do you believe that? Yes. Jude said so. Man of old foreordained to this condemnation to rise up in the last day to disbelieve God's word. 
How many knows that's the scripture? Amen. Sure. Foreordained of God to be unbelievers. What a pitiful shape. Unbelievers. Can't help it. No more than Esau could help being Esau or Pharaoh being Pharaoh. What a pitiful condition. And if you are a believer tonight in the Word of God, how blessed your eyes are Amen. to live in this day to see Praise. the glory of God. How it's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit throughout the world. If you're not so church together, wound together by creeds and denominations, you can't even listen to the Word of God. What a horrible condition to be into. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Not a hope of ever being saved. That's what the Scripture says. So dead that they don't even understand nothing but their creeds. Notice, that woman, she wasn't dead. She caught it quickly. She was a seed predestinated to eternal life. And as soon as that flashed over her, quickly she caught it. She knew. She said, Sir... We know when Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. Who art thou? And he said, I'm he. And she believed it and went and told the man in the city. And they come out and invited him in. He never did it one more time. But the Bible said that they believed Jesus because of the testimony of the woman. Yes. Now, that's as much scripture as I know how to place it. It's right here before me. And you read the same, St. John, the fourth chapter. It's where you find it. Then it must have been Matthew. He said, let me testify. Do you remember that day we were going down into Jericho? And we were going down there to visit some friends. And you remember our friend down there, Rebecca? And she is, uh, was the, the wife of Zacchaeus. And she had told us her husband was a businessman. And how that he had, was a doubter because he was a member of the synagogue. And the synagogue said that anybody that believed this man to be a prophet was excommunicated from the church and he belonged to all the societies of the, of the day. And so they, he, he, he know if he ever confessed it, he'd be put out. But Rebecca, his wife, the disciple of our Lord, she was a believer. And she used to tell him all the time, Zacchaeus, this man, according to the scripture, oh, you have no right to interpret the scripture. The rabbi is the one who tells it. But the rabbi was wrong. The rabbi is the one who's to tell us. Notice, but Rebecca said, I stood and I saw him work and I know that he is that Messiah. He's a prophet. So the morning that he was to appear, Rebecca must have prayed all night for her husband. She wanted him to be saved. That's the way you got to pray for people. Prayer changes things. So she must have prayed all night. Along about daylight, Little old Zacchaeus got up and put on his best clothes that he had, you know, and stepped out to stole Rebecca's go to get a fresh breath of air. But that night, maybe the Lord had been dealing with him according to Rebecca's um, uh, thoughts and prayer. Now, if you want God to save your husband or your wife, just keep praying for them. Just keep praying. That's all you have to do. Just keep play, praying and believing. If there's any spark of life there at all, God will put something across the path that they'll see it. Then if they reject it, then it's up to them. But notice, then that morning she prayed hard that something would happen that would convince Zacchaeus that this was that prophet they were looking for. The Jews always believed their prophets. And the Messiah was to be a prophet because God had told him to believe nothing but a prophet. So then he had to be the prophet. So then that morning... Zacchaeus went out, and I imagine Rebecca just laughed up her sleeve and said, Praise God, he's going down there as sure as I'm laying here in this bed. Zacchaeus once goes down there, and he gets to the front gate where he you knows Jesus of Nazareth is coming. But there were so many there, he couldn't even get close to him. Then he was small in statue, so he went up Glory Avenue to Hallelujah Lane. That's usually where he crosses. And he climbed up in a sycamore tree and sat down. If you want to find Jesus, you'll find him on Glory Avenue or Hallelujah Lane or something like that. So he knew he'd cross there. So he climbed up and sat down this tree. He said, I'll watch him. And when he turns the corner, I'll pass my opinion about him. I don't believe he's any prophet. I don't believe it. And so I'll just get up in this tree and I'll get my own conception of him when he passes by. Remember, he had never saw him. So he thought, you know what? He might see me up here. So I can just see old Zacchaeus up there pulling all the limbs and leaves around him so he'd be well camouflaged. Nobody would see him. And after a while, a noise came up the street. Strange, wherever Jesus is, there's usually a lot of noise. 
And here come a lot of noise up the street. He said, well, you must be approaching. And the notice coming around the corner, a great big fellow, bald headed, said, I'm sorry, folks. You'd have to step back. Our master's very tired. He's been here. Others passing by. Now, which one of them would be him? After a while, a little meek looking fellow come by and thought, and that's what they call a prophet. That's what they call the Messiah. Why, he's no prophet. Look at him. He don't even look like one. He don't even dress like one. But he walked quietly till he got right under the tree and he stopped. And he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going home with you today. <laughs> you remember what Zacchaeus said when he joined the full gospel businessman down there after he got saved? He said that he was tucked off of his feet when not only did he know he was up there, but know who he was and said, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I'm going home with you. Zacchaeus fell down and said, Lord, if I've done anything wrong, I'm willing to make it right. How we need more Zacchaeuses today. When they can see the manifestations and the presence of the very God that's promised in the Bible and get up and walk away from it. What a pitiful condition this nation is in. What a ripened judgment condition. And many times you say, I don't have to listen to that. Go listen to somebody. I'll pat you on the back and let you live in sin. Then meet at the honor at the judgment bar and see what's going to happen. Amen. You flee from the wrath that is to come. Amen. Repent or perish. God, when he does things like he's doing today, nowhere in Scripture did he ever send such until judgment followed it. Amen. Exactly right. Judgment's going to strike as certain as I'm standing here on the platform as a servant of Christ. Certainly. You remember that. What a testimony we meet. Oh, my. And then he said, do you remember when we went out of the city too, said John? When we went out of the city, there was an old blind man sitting out there named Barnabas. And he was sitting on the rock. And we was about a hundred yards from him. And... Out of the city came a great roar. Remember how Barney Mayus testified to us and told us how it happened? He was sitting there studying about, Oh, if I could have lived in the day when great prophets walked down this road, when Elijah and Elisha, arm in arm, came down this road going to the Jordan to pull back the waters to cross over. If I would have lived in that day, I'd have run out on these cobblestones and fell down before him and said, Oh, great prophet of God, pray for me that I receive my sight. But alas, they take me over to the synagogue. I asked the priest about it. He said, Now, wait a minute, Barnabas. You're an old blind man. There's nothing can help you. The days of miracles is past. Just belong to the church and you'll be all right someday when you go to heaven. But, you know, I've always thought in my heart, he said, that... If there was ever a God, he has to still be God. Oh, brother, how we need some more man like that. And it's usually when you're thinking on things like that, that he appears. Search the scriptures. It's when people are thinking and believing. When you got your mind on staying home from the prayer meeting on Wednesday night to see We Love Susie or some of them silly red television things they got and dodging church. How do you ever go to do anything with a class of people like that? Amen. You know, the birds make their nest in spring of the year. But if that male bird hasn't been with that female bird, them eggs won't hatch. She can just hover them and be so loyal and stay there until she gets so poor she can't fly off the nest. But if that female bird hasn't been with the male bird, the mate, them eggs won't hatch. They'll rot right in the nest. And that's as bad as it is today. We've taken people by confession and letter and so forth into the church that knows no more about God than a hot and top knows about Egyptian night. And what have we got? A big nest full of rotten eggs. Man and women who knows no more about God and nothing else. It's time to clean the nest out and start from the pulpit to the janitor. And get them people in contact with God who knows what the power of God is, who's been born again by the Holy Ghost. Right? You can't make deacons out of them and them married four or five times and all kinds of stuff like that because it's a meal ticket. It's a shame. Amen. That stuff's coming out amongst our Pentecostal people and, and the weakness of the message to let the people glamour and sin and carry on and then still call themselves saints. 
We need our shaking revival. Not long ago, talking with the great, or hearing him talk, rather, the great evangelist, Billy Graham, when he was in Louisville, Kentucky. He raked them preachers. I was sitting there, Dr. Mordecai Ham, the one that led him to Christ. He's a good friend of mine. He just passed into glory at 90 something years old, a few mu- uh, about a year and a half ago. And Brother Ham was sitting there by me, and Billy got up there and he said, You bunch of lazy preachers. He said, I'll come into a city and stay there six weeks. And when I do, I'll have 30,000 confessions. You know, they call it, um, I believe that's what they call it, decisions. Decisions is all right. Decisions is confessions, stones. But what good does it do to have stones if you haven't got a stonemason to cut them out in the shapes of sons and daughters of God? What good does a million decisions do when they're still glamour and sin and act like everything and never have a, never have a change of heart? Still smoke, chew, drink, dip snuff, watch television, stay home from church and put their name on a book and call themselves Christians? Yeah. Man letting their wives out in the yard with little old things on here the other day. I seen the most hideous sight I ever seen. I was down at Clifton's cafeteria and I was waiting for Brother Oregon right to come up. And here I come a woman I, I, I never seen anything like in my life. Uh, she had green in here and red and all different colors. Might have been a nice looking woman. But the way she had one of them waterhead haircuts like the first lady, you know, and all that nonsense. And there she was standing there. And I, I'm a missionary. I've seen plaguery. I've seen leprosy. i never seen anything like that in my life. And I was going over to her to ask her if I could pray for her. Tell her that I was a missionary and I, I, I felt sorry for her. And I wanted to pray for the woman. I thought she, i I'd never seen leprosy on a person like that. A human being with green eyes, blue and all kinds of nonsense. Well, enough manicure on their lips to paint a barn with women. There was only one woman in the Bible that ever painted her face, and that was Jezebel. And God fed her to the dogs. So if you see a woman wearing that, you can say, How do you do, Miss Dog Meat? That's exactly what God called her. He fed her to the dogs. Exactly right. What we need today is a house cleaning for the kingdom of God. Right. It's, and I was going to go over and pray for that poor girl. If she'd been washed up and let her hair grow down, she'd have been a fine-looking young woman. And I started to go and pray for her, and here come two more. I said, I better keep still. I don't know. Something's happened since I've been out here. And then I noticed it all around everywhere now. What a, oh my, how can this thing go on any longer? God forbid them to do that. Yes, sir. Now, back to our subject. That morning, Zachariah said, or blind Barnabas said, I was sitting there, listening, and I heard a noise come out the street, and everybody was tumbling over one another, and I heard the priest that had told me the days of miracles has passed. He is the head of the association down there. He said, I heard him say that morning, we're going down to stop this nonsense. We're not going to handle such a meeting as that around here. <laughs> you know, the, the devil takes his man, but not his spirit. <laughs> God takes his man, but not his spirit, too. <laughs> Remember that. So when he come out there and said, we're going down to... St-. We, I heard that same priest coming out and saying, Say, you who can raise the dead, we got a whole graveyard full of them up here. Come up and raise one for us. We'll believe you. He don't clown for nobody. No, no. Remember when them Romans had him in the courts that morning, they put a rag around his face over his eyes and hit him on the head with a reed. And said, tell us who hit you. If you're a prophet, we'll believe you. You know he know who did it. But he don't clown for the devil. He does his works to magnify the Father, he said. His his own spirit today don't do to clown. He only magnifies God to bring his word to pass. Jesus said he did these things that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophets. And today he does those things to fulfill what he promised he would do. He don't have to do it. He can let you go on in without it. But he promised to do it. And that's what he's doing. The blind Barnabas, John went on with his testimony. Blind Barnabas, he said, you know, I didn't know I never heard of him. The first thing you know, the people were being staggered and I was knocked down and everything. And I said, what's all the noise about? What is all the noise? 
I, I just don't understand. What's all the noise? And finally, a nice woman said, old fellow, what is the matter? He said, lady, oh, what's all the noise about? I'm blind. I can't see. Oh, have you never heard of the prophet of Galilee? No, ma'am, I haven't, he said. Well, Jesus of Nazareth, you, you know, you're a Jew. Yes. Well, you know, our Bible tells us, our scrolls, that the Lord our God is going to raise up a prophet like Moses. And he's going to do like Moses did. Yes, I know that. It'll be the son of David. Oh, that's exactly right, said the young. I am this man's disciple. You know, all the disciples of Christ always wants to have pity on those who are blind and those who are needy. A meeting can come to the neighborhood. They'll go get every sick person they can to bring them in. See? They'll do everything, every sinner that they can get. They always want to show mercy. And this young lady said, why, he is that prophet of Galilee. He passes by. And you mean he is the Messiah? Certainly he's the Messiah. Then he said, where is he? He's about a square. Now, that's where they point you, where he was at. About a city block down the road. Well, he, uh, blind Bartimaeus said, uh, you know, I just... Uh, he'd done past me so many hundreds of following him and once throwing overripe fruit at him and said, Hey, you Galilean prophet, if you're a prophet, do this. Hey, we got a sick man down here. Let's see you heal him. Others saying one thing and some other, Hail the king of the Jews. And the other saying, Glory to the great God of heaven who's raised up the son of David among us. And ever some was singing Hosanna to the prophet, to the king. Others are making fun of him. That's the way it is. It's always a mixed crowd. Believers, make believers and unbelievers, always conglomerated together. There they are. Even when the sons of God come up before God, in the book of Job, it said Satan was setting among them. Exactly right. When the sons of God appeared in the presence of God, certainly they're always there. Now, here they were there, and one saying one thing and another. And by Bartimaeus said, I remember that the scripture said that the son of David, that Moses said that this Messiah, this prophet was to be raised up, would be a prophet. And if he'd be a prophet, he'll understand, oh, Jehovah, have mercy, have mercy, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And his faith touched Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. His faith. He had never heard him above all that crowd carrying on. Some of them shoving him down, saying, set still and so forth. But his faith touched it. And the Bible said, Jesus stood still. I want to preach on that one time. And Jesus stood still. <laughs> yes, Jesus stood still. What was it? The faith of, of a blind beggar stopped him and asked him what he wanted. Then he said to him, that I might receive my sight. He said, Thy faith, like he did the woman who touched his garment. Thy faith has saved thee. Receive your sight because your faith has saved you. He turned, starts on down the road. Blind Barnabas stood there. He told me, I would receive my sight. Here I am. First thing, he's seen something move before his hands. There, he could see his hands. Here he went down the road glorifying God. You remember that, brethren. Oh, the testimony meeting was just getting stirred up good. Oh, everything was. And you know, the devil happened to look down across the hill and found him without Jesus. They'd went off without him. That's when the devil had his chance. He said, now I've got my opportunity to sink them. Because they've gone off without their master. Now, let me say this lovingly, reverently, and brotherly. Don't you think that's just about today? I think it's the same thing. That during a time of this revival, the churches has become nasty rich. Pentecostals are no more on the street beating a tambourine. They haven't got the spunk to stand out there and have a street meeting, Harley. Very seldom you see them. That's right. Instead of having the old God saved preacher, they got some kind of an intellectual student from some Bible school trying to pattern after the world. Did not, when Israel wanted to denounce their king or denounce their king God, and when the prophet walked up before him, Samuel, he said, You don't, they want to be like the rest of the world. And Samuel said, God is your king. God has sent me to be your prophet. 
Have I ever told you anything in the name of the Lord but what come to pass? Have I ever begged you for your living? Have I ever tucked your money? No. Have I ever told you anything, thus saith the Lord, but what come to pass? No. Samuel, everything you said come to pass just exactly. We believe you to be God's prophet. Well, then stay away from your king. But they said, but, but we want to act like the Joneses, you see. They want to act like the rest of them. And brethren, with all godly respect to our organizations, that's the same thing that our churches are doing. Yes. They're trying to act like the rest of them, like Methodist, Baptist, Amen. Presbyterian, and Lutheran. Amen. Classy, starchy, well-dressed. Biggest church in the city. Big building programs. What a disgrace when millions of missionaries would be on the field today and many of them there not supported with no shoes on their feet trying to preach the gospel. And we are building millions of dollar buildings, great big outlets and schools and preaching the time is at hand, the coming of the Lord. Something's wrong somewhere. I better, uh, I'll stay back with a simple message. All right. Notice, something was wrong. And there they were. What a time for Satan to come in. We went off on a big program. The meeting started. Money flowed in. Everything. We got to increase our groups. Each one. You come over here to this one. Proselyting. Everything else. Making a bigger organization. Building bigger schools. Learning theology. So forth. Mercy goodness, you have to go ten years in school before you can be ordained a minister nearly. And then what did they do with you there? It pumped that in bombing fluid in you to take all out of you God ever put in you. That's right. It's true. God just had them ten days and done more with them than the schools can do in ten years. He put something in them and the school takes out what God put in. Learn them psychology and all that kind of stuff. And some of our great organizations... In Pentecost, I'm told that it has to stand there and for a missionary can be going to the field, take a psychiatrist test. For the goodness sake. Did you see such a thing as that? God's our test. The scripture's our test. These signs shall follow them that believe. You haven't got a PhD, LLD, they won't even let you in the pulpit. That's right. And Peter was so ignorant he couldn't even sign his own name and God made him the head of the church. Sure. What a difference. Sitting in Jamaica a few weeks ago or months ago, I was sitting there with a Christian businessman. We'd had a meeting. And all they'd done that night was testify when they had the celebrity of the islands, even some of Castro's people up there and everything. Great man. Our full gospel brethren. I speak for them. I like them. I love them. They're my brothers. I have nothing against them. And I was standing there. I said, you men made me ashamed of the message I was preaching. And they said, why was that? I said, the only thing you testified about was you had a little business down on the corner doing a hundred dollars a month and glory to God all at once. Now you got a fleet of Cadillacs. I said, you'll never compare with them, man. You can't bring the world in or you can't compare with the world. The only thing you've got to do is not to, to compare with the world like the churches and everything you're trying to do with their glamour and stuff out there. You've got to invite them on your grounds, not act like them. Let them come act like you. Amen. Amen. Oh, God. Have mercy. Hallelujah. That's right. Here we are in that kind of a mess today setting. The coming of the Lord drawing nigh. Everybody asleep, just like the Bible said it was. Here we are in that condition. Lady of seeing church age, the only church age of all the ages that Christ was put outside of his own building, knocking, trying to get back in again. Yes. That's right. The Lady of seeing age, and that's this age. Put out by our creeds and dogmas and adding to the Bible and taken away from it. And there he stands on the outside trying to get back in, and the church in there thinking that they're doing something. Having a form of godliness. The Bible speaks of an intellectual age. It said they'd have a heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure more than of God. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, and despisers of those that are right. Amen. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Amen. For this is the sort that goes and leads silly women along with divers lust, all kinds of things. Pattern after some prostitute of Hollywood instead. Christ is our example. Amen. Hollywood has nothing to do with it. And the fashions of the world and things. We need to clean up. 
Come back to God. I know I'm holding you, but I'm intentionally doing this. Notice. We'll get to the point. What I want to say to you. Notice. The winds begin to blow. The sea begin to get rough. They'd gone off without him. Gone off on a big program somewhere. Gone off to do this. Also interested in this and that and the other. And they'd left without him. A mixed multitude went up with Moses. It caused the trouble. Now, I think that's about the same things happened today. The supernatural has been done and we brought in a mixed multitude. Yes. Same thing. That's what causes the trouble. Notice. Then the roaring Satan begin to blow his poison breath across them. Whew, whew. Days of miracles is past. There's no such a thing as this. You need an intellectual education. We cannot put our ministers in a pulpit unless they have a great education. Who ever said so? Where did that come out of the Bible? Like to them businessmen that night. I said to them, I said, where'd you ever get such stuff as that? The first Pentecostals went forth, sold what they had. Amen. Left their homes and become poor, the rich did. So that they'd have eternal life. And today you all try and say how much you got. They tried to see how much they could get rid of. And a certain little singer from Chicago, the brother, I forget the Italian's name, a little preacher... And he said, um, he said, but Brother Branham, I want to call your attention to something. That's a great mistake that they made. I said, what did you say? He said, they made a mistake when they did that. I said, the Holy Ghost make a mistake, brother? He said, well, they made a mistake by selling their property. After a while, a confusion come up among them, and the people didn't have no place to go. I said, just exactly what God wanted. They went everywhere publishing the Word. They did add a home, then they went back and settled down to it. But God scattered the gospel. Why? God don't make no mistakes. He might to the intellectual mind, but not to his own way of thinking. Sure. Off on a tantrum. Now, we find out if they'd gone off on one. So excited because they seen the bread made and stuff like that. They thought, oh, we're just rolling out here and going without him. It'll be all right. And the first thing you know, the sea began to get worse and worse. Satan said, now I got him. Now I'll get rid of every one of them. Out here on the sea, and she began to dash, and the white caps and the little boat become waterlogged. The mast pole broke down, the oars broke off, and there they was letting her drive just any way they could. They were screaming for fear. Every wave, Satan is sitting on every wave there, getting his glittery eyes and showing his fangs and saying, I'll sink him on the next one. I'll sink him on the next one. All hopes is gone. But you know what? He was still watching them. The Bible said he climbed up the mountain. And he was standing up there watching him, seeing what there was in trouble. I'm so glad that grace is still in existence. If it wasn't, we'd all be gone. When he left us, he climbed the highest mountain that there could be, Calvary, and then climbed on a pass of moon, stars, Jupiter, Venus, <laughs> Milky White Way, come on in. He went so high that even he has to look down to see heaven. He can see everywhere. And his eye is on the sparrow. I know he's watching tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, I believe that with all my heart. Hallelujah. He's watching tonight. Yes. Yes. What happened? When the dark hour come along that they realized they had not had him with them. And the first thing you know, here he come walking to him on the sea. What, the only thing that could help him. And what, what did they do? They cried out. They were scared of him. Now listen close. I'm closing. They were afraid, scared of the only thing that could help them because it looked spooky. They said, he's a spirit. That's a spirit walk on the water. Nothing can do that but a spirit. Ooh, they were scared. And the only hopes they had, they was afraid of. That's the same thing tonight. The hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus is appearing amongst the people. And when they see it, they want to call it mental telepathy. They want to call it fortune telling. They want to call it every kind of a devil that can be called. And it's the only thing that can help you. Yes. What was the voice that come from him? Fear not. Be of a good courage. It's I. Yes. Amen. Amen. Look kind of scary at first. But it is I. Uh, be not afraid. Now, we've had a lot of testimony meetings. And we see what's happening to the church. Don't be scared. He's still God. 
He's just as much God as he ever was. Do you believe that? The same testimony that he was of them in that day, we can believe of him being the same testimony to us today. Can't you believe that? Let's bow our heads just a moment now. I want you to pray and say, God, I want you to be merciful to me. You pray in your own way now. God, be merciful. Have mercy. Now, don't move out, please. Don't. Just wait a minute. We're going to dismiss in a minute. Be real reverent. Our Heavenly Father, as we are quietening ourselves now, after a stirring, scratching, hard meeting, or I've tried with all that's in me, Lord, to give a testimony of what man would seen in you in the days gone by, what they could testify and say that they had seen happen and was sure it was you. You fulfilled the Scripture. Now, you promised that return again just before the end time. Honor your word, Lord. Make your word live again. Find some heart in here that you can prove your word by, Lord. Search me, O Lord. Try me. Help me. Be merciful to me, Lord. Be merciful to all of us. We're needy. I pray, God, that men and women here tonight that don't know you as their Savior, that, that they'll, they'll find a room in their heart tonight. Stop for a few minutes and take inventory. Church members that don't that knows they can, they can chase their own life, no matter what they've testified to, they look at their self and see that there's something wrong. Test yourself against the Word of God and see how it comes out. Let us all test just now, Lord, and find where we're needy and then call to Thee for mercy. While we have our heads bowed and each one of you praying, now we'll never ask you to join a church. You join any church you want to. But we're asking you this. I am tonight as a servant to Christ. If you don't know him as your Savior, and you would like to know him, and you're not raise your hand to me now. you raise your hands to him. Now remember, here's what Jesus said. He that heareth my word, St. John 5, 24. He that heareth my word, I've said it tonight as plain and simple-like form as I know to say it. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath eternal life. You've never believed or accepted it before, but you would like in the presence of God to raise your hands and say, I now accept it, God. I believe on Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I accept him now as my personal Savior. I'm going to start last night. I missed some hands. The rows to my left, to my left, the right of the building as you come in to my left. How many in there will raise your hands to God? Now, with your heads bowed, everybody praying. Don't raise your head. Pray. Well, raise your hand and say, God, I hold my hand to you and want to accept you as my Savior. Have mercy upon me. I truly believe the time is at hand and I'm not ready to go. The other night I asked that down here in California, a 76-year-old woman raised up her hand when the altar call was made, had a glorious conversion, went home and laid on her pillow and went to meet God. Seventy-six years. And right at the last moment was brought in. What if she hadn't to come? No hope. Will you raise your hand and make that one all-sufficient stand? The, the roll to my left. Isn't there a one in there somewhere? God bless you, sir. God bless you, lady. Would there be another that would raise your hand? To the center row here to my left, is there any in that row that would feel that you're not pleasing God and you haven't believed Him? Now, there's only now smoking, drinking, committing adultery, cursing. That's not sin. There's only one sin that's unbelief. You do those things because you are an unbeliever. If you was a believer, you wouldn't do those things. There's only two things. One of them is faith and the other is unbelief. One of them possess you. 
And if you're a little doubt about the Word of God, every word of it being true, then you're an unbeliever. The Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in you. If you dispute one word of God's promise or question it, there's something wrong. Would you raise your hand and say, be merciful to me, God. Let no one look. Just let the Holy Spirit. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, my sister. All right. This center row here to my left. That's one, two, three, four. There. Uh, Row, center row to my right. Would you raise your hand and say, God be merciful to me. I want you to believe. God bless you. You might have done many great things. God bless you, sonny. The Bible says a child shall lead that. He hasn't pulled his little soul through old true story magazines and things. And what's called true story, there's only one true story I can witness that's the Bible. People, little kids today who know more about David Clark than they know about Jesus Christ. Every kid says his story about all kinds of cowboy stuff and that's what goes for the American swamp. balcony to my right. Is there any in there about the scrolls in here would raise your hand and say, God be merciful to me. Raise your hand. To the balconies to my center here, some in there would raise your hand and say, God be merciful to me. I can't see too good up there. I seen the angel of the Lord in there last night, but I couldn't call it. Moved right down. Somebody struck something and went down. Raise your hand. He'll see you whether I do or not. He'll see you. Have you really got that much courage? Is there that much real something about you, man or lady, that would raise your hand and confess that you're wrong and ask for mercy? Raise your hand. To the left, then. And in the balcony. To the left. God bless you. God bless you, sir. That's a wonderful thing. God bless you, man. That's good. God, be merciful. Father God, I commit them into your hands. They, they broke every scientific rule. According to science, gravitation holds our hands down like it keeps our feet on the ground. According to their rules, our hand cannot raise because they're going downward because the weight and gravitation holds them down. But these people raise their hands. It shows that they got a spirit in them that can control the body. And they broke the rules of scientific laws and raised up their hands to the Creator said, Be merciful to me. Now, Lord, I'm saying this. In the presence of God, Christ, Holy Spirit, holy angels, all the hosts of heaven, and this company, you promised, if that was sincere from their hearts, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment but pass from death to life. I give them to you, Father, as the trophies of your word being made manifest, preached by the Spirit of the Lord. And they are yours. Keep them from the judgment and fulfill your will in them. Give them the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If they've never been baptized with Christian baptism, May they receive it, Father, and may they receive Holy Ghost baptism and become workers. From these little children that raise their hands to the oldest, men, women, boys or girls, the teenagers that raise their hands, God grant it. Through Jesus Christ's name, I give them to you, Father. They are yours. It was your spirit that called them. I spoke your word, and they heard it and believed. And now they raise their hands that they accepted it, and you promised it. I want to meet them in a better land where there's no death nor sorrow. And at that day, how we'll hug one another around the neck and scream for joy. And remember this night in Salem, Oregon, when the meeting will be brought up on the canvas of the great screen of God, and they'll see those hands that went up, how happy those people will be, how thankful I'll be to present the trophies to you. Grant it, Father, they are yours in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, in the quietness and in the presence of the Almighty, we still have about ten minutes.
Let's, we couldn't call too many prayer cards. Tomorrow night I'm just going to come in and call the prayer cards, if the Lord willing. I want you to believe it without prayer cards. I'm going to do something else just in a moment. But how many in this building that does not have a prayer card? And you believe that Jesus Christ is the same Christ that I gave that testimony after testimony, had those disciples to testify how they know he was the Christ. And Hebrews 13, 8 says he's same yesterday, day, and forever. How many believe that you have faith enough to touch his garment? Just raise your hands up. Say, pray for me. I believe. You without prayer cards. Without the prayer cards. Now, please be reverent just a moment more. I know it's it's late, but it's not too late. It's 20 minutes earlier than we was last night. But just be reverent. Now pray. Just each one bow his head in his own way. And then you pray. While I watch, committing myself to God, if you're interested in God and your salvation and to see the signs and wonders that I have said here in the Bible that he did, and you want to know where the one that you're p- professing your faith in, and you that raised your hand a while ago, lay, may he come tonight because of this altar call and prove to you that he's your Savior, that he does know your heart. And it was him that spoke to you, and he's the one that can speak back now. Just be reverent. Just pray. Don't doubt. May you raise your head just a moment. Peter and John, passing through the gate called Beautiful, said, Look on us. That not that they were something to attract. Now, you was confessing to God, praying for some certain trouble. Now, you believe with all your heart. Now, be alert. The Holy Spirit is very timid. How many knows that? Very timid. He just won't tolerate nothing wrong. So as soon as it's called, answer quickly. Just pray. Believe. Now, the Bible said that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever, and he's right now a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Do you believe that? Well, if he is the same high priest, if you touched him, he'd act the way he did yesterday, the day that when he's on earth. Do you believe that? Sure. See, the woman touched his garment, and she went off and sat down, and he said, somebody touched me. He looked around until he found the woman, told her what her trouble was, and her faith had healed her. He's the same today. Please, please don't move around. I'm not scolding, but look. See, here's what the devil keeps saying to me. They don't believe you or they'd listen to you. See? You remember what he told me at Greensville? How many in here the, is here when I was here the first time? Or you remember me coming to you and I put my hand out and you'd touch my hand and I, and then if I just kept still, don't try to use my own thinking, it would tell you what was wrong with you. Remember that? You remember me telling you that he told me it had come to pass that I know the very secret of their heart? Remember me telling you that? Now, raise your hand if you remember me saying that what that he told me if I be real reverent. See, there you are. Now, it has come to pass. See? So that makes it true. The Bible said, if there be one among you who is spiritual or a prophet, and what he says comes to pass, then you hear him. If it doesn't come to pass, then don't you fear him. Because I'm not with him. That's the more sense. See? Because if God's there, he'll make it true. Now, you just pray. You without prayer cards. You with the prayer cards. God willing, I'll get you in the line tomorrow night up here on the platform. Without prayer cards. Real reverend. They that wait upon the Lord shall. All right. He's here now. Did you ever see that picture of it? Yes. Yeah. I meet you at the judgment bar. It's not a foot from where I'm standing right now. That's right. It's here. See if it's the same Christ. See if that's his spirit or not. Do you pray? Touch his garment. Say, Lord Jesus, let me touch you. 
speak back through Brother Branham. It'll prove to me that you're the same yesterday and forever. I can't make... Yeah, I see a woman just bowed her head right here. There's a light right over the little lady. Look this way back there, lady. Second one sitting in back there. You're suffering with stomach trouble, complications. Do you believe that God will make you well? Do you do it? The little lady sitting second one in with her head down yet. If she'll believe with all of her heart, she may have it. Do you believe it? You missed it. It's gone from you. Shame on you. All right. It's over this little lady sitting here. You believe you keep God's promise, sir? The lady in my place. You believe? little thin looking woman sitting there by the man you believe with all your heart you're suffering with heart trouble that's right let me tell you something about yourself you've got heart trouble so bad that they have to keep oxygen in the house whether if you have an attack or not now that is true sir you know that you believe it with all your heart you can have your healing it's up to you What's the matter with these people? Praise God, my, my, my. Hallelujah. No wonder you're dead. You'll always be that way. Yes. Where's the numbness of your spirit? Can't you awaken to Christ? Amen. Don't let the innocent suffer for the guilty, God. Grace and mercy provided and still won't even recognize it. What are you going to do? Lady sitting right there seems to have faith, looking right at me, suffering with diabetes. Diabetes. Yeah. She might not understand me very well because she's a Scandinavian. Hallelujah. A Dane. You believe me to be God's prophet, lady? Thank you. Thank you, Hallelujah. lady. Praise you believe with all your heart. And the diabetes will leave you. You're not from here anyhow. You're not from the group around here. You're from up in Oregon, but you're up on the Columbia River. <laughs> That's right. A place called Dells or something like that. Mm-hmm. Your name is Mrs. Uh, Lund. That's exactly right. That's thus saith the law. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You accept it and believe it and it'll be over. What's the matter with the church anyhow? That man sitting there looking at me from Eugene, got eyes and ear trouble. You, is that right, sir? Stand up on your feet there and accept your healing. Hallelujah. Have you got a prayer card? You don't need one. Jesus Christ makes you well by your faith. What's the matter with the church? Numb to the gospel? Hallelujah! Let's praise him. Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord Jesus. How we praise you for your goodness. You that raised your hand a while ago and you believe me to be God's servant, come down here, let's have a word of prayer together. Walk right out of your seat. Everyone that raised your hand and you that uh, don't think that you're right with God in the presence of God, come right down here now and stand here at the altar. Let's have a word of prayer together. Every soul that wants to be saved, come now. That's it. That's right. Come out of the balcony up there. In the presence of Christ, we got to break this old cold spirit in here, friends. There's too much devil unbelief around here. That's exactly right. Run for your life. Get to Christ as quick as you can. Something's going to happen. Judgment will follow this. Yes. Don't you believe it? Amen. Shake away from that cold, formal devil that's trying to bind you down. Let every soul that's not right with God get around this altar right now. In the presence of God, I call you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Come now. You know the song, Oh, Why Not Tonight? You know that chorus, Oh, Why Not Tonight? That was the song, song that you all sing.
or go to sing an invitation song while these precious people are gathering up here. Friends, I speak to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. You might have done a many things in your life that's been good, no doubt for what you had. But this is the greatest move you've ever made, is to come to Christ. That's exactly right. While we're singing now, I want every person in here that's not right with God to get, come around the altar right now. You come up here and get right with God and get that coldness away from you. Amen. Get that unbelief away from you. Why are you afraid? Jesus was standing here tonight. He said, do not be afraid. It's I. Isn't that the same way he did when he was here before? Amen. Look at the grace of God. When them people wouldn't accept it, they'll probably die with them troubles. Yes. And there he went right out to the audience and pulled them anyhow. Amen. To show that he's God. Amen. Yes. Certainly. All right. Yes. Let's sing. Where could I go? you rise up now and come? Where else can you go? Go to your church, it'll perish with you. Go to your friends, they'll die and die like you will. Go to your creeds, God will go. You come to Christ, and you have eternal life. To know Him is life, to know Him. And His presence, when He's here, proving He's the same God that was with them out there that night. Won't you come? One more time, we're going to call. Come on now. If there's any condemnation in your life, come on. Hang a refuge for my soul. Here's what you're going to do. Needing a friend to guide me to end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Now, while these people are still coming, I want some of you that's real ill praying grounds with God. I want some of you pastors go down here now. And I want the pastors and those Christian women that knows God to come around these women here. You men who know God and interested in souls. You know what the Bible said? In this last days of prophecy said that the people would be so cold and indifferent. And when the Holy Ghost come through, just to seal those who sighed and cried for the abomination done in the city. I want each one of you ministers to point out me in your congregation that person that sighs and cries day and night for the sins of the people in the city. Could you put your hand on that person? And remember, the Holy Spirit is commanded to only seal those. Touch not the others, you're going to perish. What are you playing church for? There's no need to play. Don't play with God. God's not a play instrument. He's God. Amen. Now, you that's got enough uh, strength and believe and wants to see souls saved, come around here and stand with these women, you women, and around these men, you men, that really know God and wants to see souls saved and wants to see a revival, wants to see something happen. Come stand around them now and let's show them that we love them and we want to see God save them. Minister brothers, get out among them. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen, I want to talk to you while they're coming. Have faith. You come up here. He that will confess me before man, him will I confess before my father. Now you confess what you, or your dilatory, how dilatory, how you've neglected God. You confess that is wrong. And say that I'm sorry, God, that I did that. Find favor with him. Then watch what he'll do for you. You just confess that you're wrong, and he'll take care of the rest of it. Now let's let the whole audience bow our heads, and every person, wherever you are, if you're interested in these people, pray. Everybody now, walk up close to you all here and lay your hands upon somebody that's standing there. Our Heavenly Father, we are deeply grateful to see the Holy Spirit in the hour of grace and understanding. Break through the shackles of unbelief 
tear down and shake the very suck tags of hell into the devil's eyes, blind him from the gospel, and yet go beyond that and pick out them souls and bring them in. You're still God. You're still Jesus, the risen one. We thank thee for these. They're standing here. They're your children. There's only one thing they can do is come and confess that they're wrong. And he that will confess his sins shall have mercy. He that hides his sins shall not prosper. You said so, God. And pray, God, that you'll break up the old, full, carnal spirit that tries to hold this revival in captivity. We take it over in the name of the Lord Jesus and break the power of Satan by the gospel of the resurrection and the presence of Jesus Christ in this dark, evil hour. Satan, turn the people loose. Come out of them. You're a loser, and there's not a one that God's ordained to life that you can hold. They'll come anyhow, no matter what you do. They're coming anyhow. God said they would. All the Father has given me will come to me, and none of them is lost. I pray, God, that you'll hear now and make the Satan, the evil one, turn these people loose. Make each one of their homes. May their hearts be on fire. May they pray all night tonight, all day tomorrow. May there be such a thing take place until the shaking of the heart. Start a revival in their hearts, in their homes, in their churches, in the community. Grant it, Lord. We love you. We believe you that you are the Son of God.